like and subscribe, and leave a comment below. Beyond Antarctica, Chapter 25 The ground beneath their feet trembled violently. The tremors seemed to be rising from deep within the earth, like a sleeping giant suddenly awakened. Earthquake, John shouted. The crew fell to their knees, hands bracing themselves against the quaking ground as rocks and debris shook loose from the surrounding cliffs. The earth itself seemed to protest their presence, groaning and cracking as the tremors grew more intense. Just as quickly as it began, the shaking stopped, leaving an eerie quiet in its wake. The crew slowly got to their feet. Kim pointed towards the horizon with her voice trembling as she spoke. Look over there, the mountain. In the distance, a massive mountain loomed, its peak wreathed in smoke that curled and twisted like a living entity. The sky above it was darkening, and the smell of sulfur tinged the air. That's a volcano, Todd said, and it doesn't look like it's going to stay quiet for long. John's eyes were fixed on the ominous sight. This is the last place we search, he muttered, more to himself than to the others. Then we head back. It's as if the island is protesting our presence. The crew gathered around what seemed to be a large ancient hatch embedded in the ground, the building beside it eerily similar to the one they had encountered before. But this one had a distinct difference, a series of intricate carvings etched into the surface of the hatch. Kim knelt beside it. This writing, it looks like some kind of warning she said, pointing out the crude, crossed-out images carved into the stone. It's like it's telling us what not to do, like we shouldn't open this. Todd stepped closer, examining the hieroglyphs. She's right. These symbols, they all seem to point to danger. It clearly looks like a warning of some kind. John leaned in, wiping away the years of dust that had accumulated on the hatch. He blew on it, rubbing the dirt off to reveal more of the carvings. But the moment his hand touched the hatch, a brilliant bolt of lightning shot out, striking him with such force that it sent him crashing to the ground. His jacket smoked and the acrid smell of burnt fabric filled the air. No! Dad! Kim screamed, rushing to her father's side. The others quickly joined her, forming a protective circle around John. Just then, another bolt of lightning shot out from the hatch, crackling through the air and striking Kim, sending her quivering to the ground, shaking violently, until the bolt stopped, leaving her motionless on the ground. The crew watched in horror as the hatch continued to unleash its fury. Bolt after bolt of lightning shot out, each one finding its mark with terrifying accuracy. Bob took the brunt of the assault and was the last to be left standing. His shirt was smoking as burn marks appeared across it. He staggered back and forth, trying to escape the onslaught, but a fourth bolt hit him square in the back, sending him to the ground. As he fell, the last thing he saw was his crew lying helplessly around him, their bodies smoking and motionless. His eyes fluttered, and the darkness closed in, swallowing him whole as the world faded from view. They awakened slowly their consciousness returning like the lifting of a heavy fog. The last thing they remembered was the searing pain of lightning coursing through their bodies, and now, as their eyes adjusted to the dim light, they found themselves in a cold, unfamiliar place. The walls around them were smooth and metallic, the air tinged with a sterile scent. It was clear they were in some sort of prison cell. John was the first to fully regain his senses, he pushed himself up on his elbows and took in their surroundings. The cell was stark and bare, with only the clothes on their backs remaining. Just beyond the bars, a table sat in plain view, their gear neatly laid out on it, tantalizingly close but completely out of reach. The room itself was dimly lit by a series of small glowing panels embedded in the ceiling, casting an eerie glow across the cell. John got to his feet and approached the cell bars cautiously. He reached out to touch them, and as soon as his fingers made contact, a sharp, stinging shock jolted through his hand. He yelped, pulling his hand back quickly with his fingers tingling with the aftershock. Yeah, this is not good, he muttered, shaking his hand as he turned to the others who were beginning to stir. Kim was the next to rise. Where are we? she asked. No idea, John replied, glancing back at the table. But they were kind enough to leave our gear just out of reach. Hey, Bob, he said, turning to his friend. Did they leave you your belt? 
Bob sat up with a grin slowly spreading across his face as he felt around his waist. Yeah, they sure did, he said with a glint of hope in his eyes. But before he could make a move, the sound of a door sliding open caught their attention. Three figures entered the room. Two of them held what looked like small clubs, but the tips were sparking with electricity, crackling with a menacing energy. The third figure, who seemed to be the leader, approached the cell door and held out a hand. With a simple wave, the door slid open. The leader stepped forward, holding a small device in his hand that bore a striking resemblance to the translator the crew had brought with them, though theirs still lay on the table with the rest of their gear. The device emitted a soft hum, and then, to their surprise, the figure began to speak. The device, translating his words, You are awake the figure said, with an underlying current of authority. Good, there is much to discuss. Where did you people come from? John stepped forward with his gaze narrowing as he studied their captors. The three individuals standing before them looked just like modern humans, youthful, vibrant, and dressed in high-tech clothing that seemed to shimmer under the dim light of the room. The leader, who had just spoken, looked at John with an intense curiosity. We come from a faraway land, John replied. We are explorers, he paused, observing their puzzled expressions. Their leader replied, but nothing can live on the surface for long. He continued, his voice dropping to a more serious tone. It's too savage, too uncontrollable. The predators that roam these lands cannot be contained. How do you keep them at bay? The leader stepped closer to John with a look of disbelief. His eyes darted across John's face, taking in every detail. What disease do you suffer from? He asked, his voice filled with a mixture of genuine curiosity and alarm. John's confusion deepened as he took a step back, sensing the growing unease in the room. Disease? He repeated, glancing at the rest of his crew, who were watching the exchange with wide eyes. No, we're all healthy. We're not suffering from anything. But the leader shook his head backing away slowly as his gaze swept over the entire group. You all are infected, he muttered, his voice laced with something that resembled pity. Without warning, he quickly waved his hands, signaling the two other figures to leave the room. Vent the room and sterilize. The leader bellowed as the two figures rushed out, with the cell door closing swiftly behind them. Almost immediately, bursts of mist sprayed down from the ceiling, filling the room with a cool chemical scent. The mist rained down upon them, clinging to their skin and clothes, only to be sucked out moments later with a forceful vigor that left them momentarily breathless. The leader watched them intently, his expression unreadable as he shook his head. You are clearly suffering from some form of disease, he said. Look at the cracks and lines in your skin, the heavy fissures around your eyes. John instinctively reached up, touching the lines on his face. You mean, my wrinkles, he asked. The leader nodded. John let out a small, incredulous laugh. Well, first of all, my name is John, he said, regaining his composure. He gestured towards his crew, introducing them one by one. This is Kim, Todd, Tony, and Bob. We're just human, like you. The leader, still eyeing them with skepticism, introduced himself with a slight nod. I am Jackson, the leader of this facility he said, his voice carrying the weight of authority. This place is called Sanctuary, the last hope for humanity. He paused, studying their faces again with something akin to wonder. We thought we were the only ones left after the great catastrophe. Thousands of years have passed, and we have found no signs of humanity, no other survivors. You can understand our shock when you suddenly appeared on our doorstep. Jackson's expression grew even more intense, his eyes narrowing as he locked onto John. How many more humans are there from where you come from? He demanded, the weight of his words hanging in the air like the sword of Damocles. John felt the pressure of the question, with the implications spinning rapidly in his mind. He knew he had to tread carefully to give enough truth to satisfy Jackson's curiosity without revealing too much. There are many, John replied. He chose his words with deliberate precision. We thrive in our lands. Jackson's eyes widened, the surprise evident in the sharp intake of his breath. And you all live on the surface? 
The question carried a disbelief so profound it was almost tangible, as if the very concept was beyond his comprehension. Yes, John affirmed as he braced for the next wave of questions. He could see the gears turning in Jackson's mind, the puzzle pieces not quite fitting together. Jackson's confusion deepened as he tried to reconcile what he was hearing with what he knew to be true. So, the harsh conditions on the surface are why you look so... rough? The word hung in the air, a blunt assessment that carried more weight than Jackson likely intended. Before John could respond, Kim stepped forward. She couldn't let that comment pass without a challenge. Rough. No, he looks that way because of his age. She snapped with her voice cutting through the tension like a knife. Jackson turned to her, with the confusion on his face deepening. His age? He repeated, as if the concept was alien to him. Yes, Kim said, holding her ground. For example, I'm 28 years old. For a moment, the room was still, the significance of her words sinking in. Jackson's demeanor shifted rapidly, his disbelief mingling with a sudden intense curiosity. You say you're 28 cycles, or years as you call it. With his voice quivering, he continues, that's impossible. No one lives past 25. I'm 22 and close to my end. The shock on Jackson's face was alarming, his worldview cracking under the weight of this new information. John could see it. Jackson was struggling to process the idea that people could live beyond what he had been taught was the natural limit of life. John stepped in. Son, I'm 56 years old. Jackson's reaction was immediate. He gasped, stumbling backward as if the words themselves had physically struck him. His composure shattered. He hurriedly opened the cell, stepping out with a haste that bordered on panic. He sealed the door behind him, his hands trembling as he brought his wristband up to his mouth, his words spilling out in a frantic murmur. The newcomers claim to be of great age. One claims to be fifty-six. A synthetic voice crackled to life from the wristband, its tone cold, analytical, and devoid of emotion. It cannot be. All human life cycles are set in their DNA to secure the safety of humanity at the age of twenty-five. Jackson's eyes darted from the wristband to the crew, the shock still raw in his expression. But, yet, here we are, he muttered, as if he couldn't quite believe what was unfolding before his eyes. Without warning, a golden light flooded the room, sweeping over them with an intensity that left no corner untouched. The light was warm, almost comforting, but it carried with it a strange, tingling sensation that coursed through their bodies. John, Kim, and the others instinctively shielded their eyes, with the light too bright to stare into directly. The wristband spoke again, its voice clinical. Scan complete. Isolate. They are a potential biohazard. The rest of the facility cannot be given this information. Age is restricted and will be redacted from all records. Understood, Jackson replied. Kim, with her frustration boiling over, called out from within the cell. Hey, you said you were the leader here. Doesn't that mean you make the decisions? Jackson turned to her. Yes, I am the leader, he said. But the quantum computer has always guided our civilization since the creation of Sanctuary. The AI that operates it is the most advanced system ever created. For thousands of years, it has kept us safe, running all the day-to-day -day essentials, freeing up our time for more productive ventures. For now, Jackson said, you will remain in isolation until we decide what to do with you. His words hung in the air, a chilling reminder of the precariousness of their situation. The room fell into a tense silence as the crew processed the gravity of what they had just learned. This society, so advanced and yet so meticulously controlled, guided by a machine that dictated every aspect of their existence, John exchanged a look with the others, with a silent understanding passing between them. They were now entangled in a reality far more complex and dangerous than they had ever imagined. The path forward was uncertain, and the stakes had never been higher. This is not goodbye, nor the end. Until the story continues, my friends, be an rocker.